Welcome to Aquarium Dog. Subscribe, like, and comment. Hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm back here in another video about fish and that's it. These are some local species all caught around here. We have, uh, this is the winter flounder. Another one there. Uh, the, this is some wider ones. Uh, those are uh, window pane flounders. We've got a black drum, spotted hake, and striped sea robin. A little food in for them. How much time a week do you think you, you say you spend in here? Way too much. Probably. I think I spend more time taking care of. Uh, these tanks than I do teaching. Uh, they got this guy back here, the rock gunnel. Oh, oh no! The hake tried to eat him. <laughs> That's why he hides. It's a cool fish. Oh, there he goes. Little eel like Lenny thing. This tank's a little dirty, but it's just some assorted reefy fish in this reefy tank that doesn't even have a real filter on it. Uh, been waiting to update this. We have an, a nice new sump down here, but we just haven't had the time or resources to move everything out and lift this up higher. Obviously, you can't, that sump's not going to be functional uh, at the level of this tank now. We need to lift the tank higher, slip the sump back under, and plumb it in. That's going to eat up a few days that I don't have to spare. What kind of filtration system is this here? So, uh, this is just, uh, it's a little underpowered. These beads should all be in motion right now. There's only like a section of them that stay in motion back over here. They're just like bio ball type things that are supposed to be fluidized in this chamber. And uh, the, the pump is not quite big enough to run it properly. Uh, our idea was to run these two pseudo chrysals, which were made uh, for keeping jellyfish and use them as larval rearing tanks, but they didn't work. The larvae, we thought, getting uh, you know slowly turned uh, like this would help keep them off the walls, uh, but they got confused and they went into the corners and they made it through. They ended up not being very useful for larvae, unfortunately, but they're nice to have on hand uh, because if I get a really nice jellyfish or tinafor or something, I could bring it back here and I get the flow just right and I could put the jellyfish and, and I always have plenty of plankton on hand for the larvae so I can feed them and I can keep them alive for pretty long periods in these tanks. And, and you can't do that in a normal tank. So that's been a great thing for our marine biology classes. Um, and they're, they're also really good to, for, for getting photos of the jellies in. Uh, I have some amazing jellyfish photos from in these tanks. These column tanks I use for the gramas. I've got in here, Grama melicara, the black cat basslet. Uh, this is new broodstock. They haven't started spawning yet, but hopefully soon. Got four of them in here. They're getting along, so I think they should be compatible, and I think they should eventually produce some babies for me. And then this is Grama Dijongai. This is the one that's endemic to Cuba. And uh, we just, these guys just started producing uh, a couple of months ago. And we have our first babies coming through from these. There's three and three. Um, so these guys, where it's legal to sell these, which is anywhere besides the United States, uh, these guys are wholesaling for about $2,000 a piece. Uh, because of our trade embargoes against Cuba, uh, you can't legally get them here. Um, since we're breeding them, uh, I'm hoping that uh, our, our donor who, who paid for them will figure out how to jump through the right legal hoops to get their offspring back out into the trade. Uh, but I, I don't know if or when that will happen. This fish, uh, as far as we can tell, is very recently speciated from its close relative, Grama um, uh, Loretto, the, the, the fairy basslet or, or royal grama. Um, 
at, because it has a very small home range. It's only really found in Cuba. They've, there's one record of one having been seen in the Cayman Islands, but primarily Cuba. Um, and with such a small home range, it's vulnerable, uh, especially with invasive lionfish down there eating fish in this size range. So if if that small home range, uh, if you know if that small population were to get wiped out, we could lose this whole brand new species. Um, and with its high value in the trade, that's another pressure on wild populations. So if we can get these guys bred in captivity uh, and and into the hands of more breeders and fish hatcheries, then uh, it could be a widespread fish all produced in captivity and not taken from the wild anymore. And that whole captive population could you know, serve as a sort of an arc in case uh, things don't go well for that small wild population. So this is Grama um, Loretto, the, the fairy basslet, also known as the royal Grama. Very common, inexpensive fish very, very closely related to this guy, uh, and found in the same habitat, same depth range. Uh, so this is my broodstock, just these two. They spawn regularly, although their spawning season is coming to an end now. Uh, and these are some of their young that uh, I raised over the last couple of months. You can see there's actually Grama de Jongai. These guys are common in the wild and they're inexpensive um, and they're very raisable but they uh, have very seldom been bred in captivity and, and almost never commercially. Uh, just a couple of times really. Um, and it's because, because uh, they're so inexpensive, there's no real incentive for commercial growers to put the effort into raising them. Uh, which is kind of unfortunate because uh, because it's raisable and, and it's a fish that it's kind of difficult to catch. They live inside these caves, uh, you know, little tiny crevices, and a lot of the collectors, um, they either have to stick something into that crevice to get them out, which can be physically destructive to the reef, or they're injecting some kind of drug in there. Now, nobody in the Caribbean is using cyanide like we worry about in the Philippines, but they're using drugs like quinaldine, uh, or even just clove oil, which is an anesthetic for fish, uh, they'll inject that stuff in and it's not as destructive as something like cyanide, but it probably still is having an environmental impact on the reef. And that's a very common uh, technique for catching little reclusive um, basslets like this. I, I did raise some about uh, 20 years ago at Sequest down in Puerto Rico. I raised a batch of these, but uh, I'm certain they had already been raised before that. Um, but not commonly. One of, the, one of the other reasons they're not raised in captivity more often is that it, they don't put out one big bunch of eggs at a time. They lay a few eggs each night. So if you put a, and you really can't pull those eggs out. They kind of keep a rotating nest. They'll have a nest going and they'll lay some eggs tonight and then they'll lay a few more eggs tomorrow night and a few more eggs the next night. And so then, you know, a few days later, you get a few larvae hatch, and then a few more hatch the next night, and a few that next night, and and so um, there's kind of a steady trickling of larvae out, and no chance to get one big batch of larvae into one rearing tank, and that's logistically difficult when you're trying to raise things on a big scale. You want to have a thousand larvae in a rearing tank to be able to manage the tank well and the food densities and things like that. If you get 10 or 15 larvae, that's a very difficult larval tank to manage. That's Manidia berylina, the tidewater silverside. It's a local, locally collected species, but that particular group was bred in captivity at the Stony Brook Marine Science Lab. They're, they're not a high value fish, but they're a good model fish for breeding.
this room is like our support room, our, our prep room for the course lab. So we have specimens in here that go out for our marine biology labs. There's a goose fish. We've got some big sea stars here, microscopes on the shelf over there. But uh, right now it's also doubling as my phytoplankton culture room. So I've got over there three different species of phytoplankton, Tetraselmus, Ketoceros, and Isochrysis. And I've got their primary cultures up here. Um, so I culture these guys, I grow them up into a, uh, about a two gallon container, get them as dense as I can using some nutrients, sterilized seawater, and a little CO2 injection. And then I'll use that phytoplankton to feed the copepods and the rotifers that I feed to the larval fish. So I'm gonna start new primary cultures of this. This is Isochrysis our most nutritious phytoplankton. And I'm just flaming the top here to sterilize it and keep any microbes from falling in in the process. I'm gonna... And this is all for uh, the babies? Yeah, yeah, it's to feed, it's, it's to feed the zooplankton that I feed to the babies. Uh, but it's also very important to put into the uh, larval tanks early on uh, those larvae, as I mentioned earlier, you can't put a filter on those tanks. Um, so we put phytoplankton in and bright light, and the phytoplankton in part helps to maintain water quality. It's algae, it's photosynthesizing. Um, We have uh, seawater, uh, it's, it's synthetic seawater, ESV seawater, um, and I have uh, a nutrient mixture, it's called Guillard's F over 2, uh, it's a standard nutrient mix for marine algae. So I mix up a batch of that, it lasts me probably a year. Um, I put a few milliliters into a, into a liter of water and then I pour it out into these flasks and then I sterilize the flasks in uh, an autoclave. And then I keep them here, and when I'm ready, we make new cultures. So this one is Isochrysis. So our next generation, this one is Ketoceros, that's a diatom. And this one is Tetraselmus, 